very good morning once again. Uh, welcome to uh, the Economic Forum, Ilham. Uh, you are actually on our Board of Governors as well, and Ilham has been on the Advisory Board of IEF almost from the very beginning. This is the ninth year of the Indonesia Economic Forum, and uh, we are very privileged that we have Ilham here representing uh, one thickness of the National ICT Council, Republic of Indonesia. Uh, for those who may not be aware what exactly it does, Ilham will tell us. But I think the topic of the day is about uh, the broader picture of ICT, digital transformation, and uh, how Ilham sees uh, the outcomes of the takeaways from the G20 and the B20 discussions that happened. You were there in Bali yourself, Ilham? Yeah, I was there. Yes. Yeah. Okay, not so over G20. to you. Yes. <laughs> not for G20 though, for B20. For B20, yeah. correct. So over to you, Ilham. Let's hear a little bit about what is your views, and then we'll have a conversation here where we would also have questions from the floor. Yeah. Well, thank you, Sachin. Um, I think the Indonesian uh, agenda for G20 has been very consistent throughout the year. Uh, there were three things uh, always, always emphasized, which is the uh, reformation of the global health system because of the pandemic. Secondly is digital transformation particularly in uh, relationship to economics. And the third one is the energy transition and uh, to uh, renewable energy, of course. Uh, if you look at the result of the G20, I think it's fair to say that the most significant result is, pro there, there is a few, right? One is uh, that uh, Indonesia was in a position to sign the so-called Just Energy Transition Partnership Agreement with the G7. Actually, so it's not really G20, but it is, or it was announced during G7, which uh, is uh, related to the one that was already done with South Africa. Uh, the scope is larger. South Africa was $8.5 billion. This one is 20, 10 from the private sector, 10 from the public sector. And the difference with South Africa, this one is much more focused. This is only energy creation, basically. It is not EV and not, not other things. This is really $20 billion only for uh, for renewable energy uh, power stations. Uh, sounds like a lot of money, but actually if you do the calculation, how much would it cost to shut down all the uh, coal-fired power stations? About $35 billion. <laughs> That's the calculation. So $20 billion is a good start, but certainly it's not enough. But well, we, we don't want to shut down the power stations tomorrow. It will need some more time. So uh, I think uh, it's a good start, a very good start, and uh, the two leading countries from the G7 that did the discussion, that were leading the negotiations with Indonesia were, were the United States and Japan. They have different positionings regarding, uh, what is that, uh, net zero carbon. Uh, 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 I think that uh, particularly in the US still sees a limited future, but there is some future for, for the gas sector particularly. Uh, as a traditionary fuel. Uh, so um, Indonesia being a gas producer, uh, I think will uh, also is uh, very much benefiting from that, from that, from that um, can I say, the, the conviction of the US that the gas will play, play a role. That's not necessarily the case with all G7 countries. Some are very radical, they don't want to see any oil and gas. <laughs> If possible, shut down tomorrow, like Germany. Germany wants nothing like that. Although it's a bit hypocrite, yeah, because uh, Germany actually is now establishing uh, receiving stations for LNG uh, because uh, of the uh, shutdown of the pipeline from Russia to Germany. 50% of the gas uh, is actually originally from Russia and it's not available anymore, so the next winter will be tough. So that is an, a major uh, result, I think, of uh, G20. Another major result is basically the fact that there was something like a communique uh, actually agreed between parties. And I think that was very smartly done by the diplomats. Basically, if there would be a right, uh, outright condemnation of the war between Russia and uh, Ukraine, I think uh, we would not have had an agreement between all G20 nations. There are some uh, which are not openly, but they are basically don't want to uh, step on Russia's feet yeah? within the G20 nations. That's clear. So the issue was not brought forward regarding the raw war, but basically regarding uh, food. Using food and energy as a weapon is something we should 
condemn, and everybody could agree on that, right? So that, I think that was quite smart, and I can see that uh, some of these issues, there are maybe uh, we can uh, uh, get agreement if we don't frontally uh, basically uh, talk about it and want to have a either yes or no, but it's like on the sidelines, yeah? it's like indirectly. Uh, and, and I think through that, uh, there was an agreement. Now you, you, you see that I have spoken about the war because that's actually the fourth on the agenda. So one is the uh, pandemic uh, or the global health system, the digital transformation and the energy. And the fourth one is actually, and there's not something that was originally planned, but that, is, that just came and that is just developed during the year. This is basically the war between, the, 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 the war between Russia and Ukraine. So uh, I have not addressed digital transformation yet, right? <laughs> so uh, to the best of my knowledge, I, it is not at the same level uh, being uh, as a res presented as a result of, of G20. Well, digital transformation is well on its way in most countries in the G20. Uh, it is, uh, uh, I, I have not seen any, uh, any major breakthrough and how to do things better or, or what not to do uh, between the G20 nations. I think the big uh, elephant in the room is still uh, trust regarding data between nations, which uh, right now, if you look around in the G20 nations, many of them still adhere to the, what I would call data sovereignty concept. Yeah? So if we have uh, data, uh, we have to make sure that uh, this data needs to be resident in that particular country as well for legal reasons. That is the claim. So if we are uh, basically, uh, say you, you are a company and you, you uh, create data in Indonesia, then uh, Indonesia will look at that, that there needs to be the data in a data center in Indonesia. And I think the argument is always uh, for fraud. Yeah? If there's fraud happening, how does Indonesian police get a hold of the data? So there is very little uh, trust between nations that the legal uh, the legal, what is that, um, uh, legal uh, agreements between countries and companies is enough in order to make sure that, that uh, if in case of any misuse of the data, there is a, enough leverage for the, uh, for the authorities of a particular country to get a hold of the data and even investigate into detail. That is something which is, I think, um, there's still some way to go. Yeah? There's a lot of uh, I, I ego, ego national beha uh, behavior and thinking maybe also uh, because um, um, the, the thought is that there's a lot of uh, labor or a lot of uh, jobs related to that. So as much as possible, digital uh, assets should be in the country because it's, I think the thinking is of many that that is related to, first of all, security and secondly, also to jobs and investments. So if you look in Indonesia, so this is not G20 now, but just uh, we have major investments ahead of us uh, in, f in terms of uh, data center. Well, there is so many data centers been, been built in Indonesia and uh, they do consume a lot of energy. Well, there is one project that I know of in Batam. There's supposedly nine data centers uh, one, once it's finished and every data center will have 50 megawatt minimum. So you look at the overall, it's like, Half, almost half a gigawatt, yeah? that's for nine data centers. It is not small. And uh, of course, uh, now, if you want to erect data centers in today's um, era, you have to make sure that the electricity is actually made from renewable and green sources. So the thought is that uh, those data centers should not add to the, to the energy challenge that we have, but they should be from the very beginning conceived to consume only uh, green energy. So it's, we're talking about green data centers. Um, so all of that, what I'm telling you now, is not an explicit result of G20. I have not seen an explicit result in terms of digital transformation, which is like a showstopper, which is something that people will say, well, this is something, quite an accomplishment. I think it's, it's more something, uh, uh, every year there's some little progress made between in the digital transformation uh, world uh, and in Indonesia that is by and large seen as an enabler for um, companies, particularly small medium-sized companies 
to basically uh, be stronger in the digital economy. And so the gap between the small and medium-sized companies and the larger ones is not getting bigger, but it's actually diminishing. Maybe. Right now, the data from the Ministry of uh, Small, Medium-Sized Enterprise and Cooperatives says that out of a 60-something million enterprises, about 20 million are already embracing digital technology. What does it mean in detail? I mean, what kind of digital technology they do? That I don't know, but they are classified as such that they already have some uh, amount of digital literacy. Fantastic. Yeah. So, Ilham, you know, you uh, very nicely connected the overall G20 uh, discussions to ICT, actually, because end of the day, ICT consumes power, electricity. Yeah. Yeah. And the energy discussion at G20 is connected because, you know, Indonesia's power requirements are going to go up as more digital transformation takes place across the region. And this is something, it is an elephant in the room because people don't understand how various parts of the economy are interconnected with each other. And uh, ICT being an enabling uh, technology, or uh, I would say not just a technology, it's an enabling philosophy. And that is something. So the question I have for you, Ilham, is what would have been an outcome that you would have looked for in the G20 or B20 scenario? Because you said nothing actually major change. If you were to run the agenda, what do you think they could have done which they didn't do? Uh, you mean in regards of ICT? ICT, yes. Well, uh, we're talking of the 20 largest economies in the world. If there would be a, something like a common standard between those uh, countries, how to basically work with one another digitally, uh, data is a major point. Yeah? Data security, data uh, management, data science, and, and, and also the, the, uh, the question who actually owns the data. Data protection is very important yeah? So uh, for the consumer. Yeah, so if there would be an agreement between, I mean, this is 80% of the world in terms of economy, that would be a major, uh, breakthrough. major breakthrough. I think uh, G20 by its nature is not necessarily geared towards ICT only, right? There are so many issues to be discussed. There's other uh, venues where you, where discussions is ongoing every, all the time, like the Internet Governance Forum, the IGF, right? There is a yearly thing. Uh, it is a United Nations discussion, and everybody who is, uh, uh, has something to say and something to do with ICT, which is basically the, the whole helix, right? There's a quadruple or quintuple helix. It's government, uh, business, academia, civil society organizations, media. So everybody has something to say, and everybody says something in, in the IGF. Uh, unfortunately, IGF is, has no, it's, it's not really a decision-making uh, organization. Right? They're, 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 what, what is being discussed there is then, tick, uh, what is that, uh, sinking and, uh, not sinking, but uh, trick, tr trickling down in every organization's mind, and the next year they come back and, and discuss it again and again. But slowly but surely, things change, but it takes time. So, uh, again, G20 is not necessarily a forum that is super focused on ICT. Because the Indonesian agenda ha uh, mentioned ICT as something to be discussed, and that was a suggestion by Indonesia, right? So, but there, there were other G20s where ICT was not so much in the forefront. Okay, so, you know, Ilham, you, uh, do you think that this is something that can still be tabled at G20 next year when it goes to India? Well, uh, I would assume so, because India has made major strides to accomplish so many things using ICT. I mean, the, uh, the, the 1.4 billion Indians having a unique uh, electronic identity, and based on that, uh, there is something like a QR code, right, in India that can be used by everybody at no cost. So there's basically no walled garden uh, by any company, so not like uh, Amazon or Alibaba, you can pay only with their own payment system, but there is something that is for free, I think, uh, usable by everybody. These are concepts which are, I think, relevant for the world. Yeah? Um, so uh, I think India says this is a so-called digital infrastructure or digital public infrastructure. And uh, this is a concept I think uh, could be applied in many parts of the world. I, I'm not sure whether every G20 country wants to do that. Yeah? I, I like US, I mean, I cannot imagine. They already have those wall gardens. And now you, you're asking basically those companies to break it down and do something publicly. And US is anyway, by its very nature, skeptical about anything that looks like big government. Right? This is like the the DNA of the U.S. 
the U.S. was basically founded on the, on, on, the, on, the, on the premise that we want as little government as possible because those people many hundred years ago were running away from big government in Europe, right? So this is somewhat in the DNA of, of U.S. and I think we cannot change that. Yeah. It is just like it is. Yeah. So it's heartening to know that actually the sequence of Indonesia then going to India could carry forward some of these initiatives yeah. and probably address the elephant in the room that didn't get addressed here yeah. because of different priorities. Yeah. Okay, I got that. So Ilham, the, uh, another point that you had made was about data and I think uh, if the nations could have some agreement on uh, how they would share data, that brings up actually, uh, con the, you know, uh, if you look at today how companies are empowering themselves, uh, either you have to make a large investment in CapEx or you can use SaaS, service as a, yeah. uh, software as a service, yeah. right? So SaaS is growing uh, tremendously because price points are very uh, attractive mm. and the technologies uh, are growing much better if you use SaaS solutions because uh, they are specialized in improving the kind of products that they make and they are able to understand customers better and react to the kind of changes that are needed. So uh, don't you think that adds another dimension of this whole idea about where is the data set up? Because SaaS products are actually not uh, from here. They're from anywhere in the world. Yeah, well, uh, again, this is uh, depending on the legal situation in a particular country, right? There are some who insist that the data needs to be onshore. Yeah? Others are more agnostic about that. And uh, I think that would be a major point to uh, agree upon. I, I, I could imagine that uh, if there would be like something like a worldwide foundation managing the data, like the internet. I mean, most people don't know that the internet is actually uh, managed by a foundation which is resident in California, right? So is it guaranteed that the internet will be always, uh, uh, what can I say, Inter will, there will be no interference from any third party because it is, uh, uh, what is that, um, uh, it is resident uh, as an organization in California. Or, uh, or should there be another concept? Should be under the under United Nations, etc. We don't know. Yeah, there's still a lot of things that are. I think uh, people need to talk about this and see what is the the best way to conceive um, the internet with all the data, how to manage it in a way that uh, all of us are sure that there's no hanky panky happening with it. Okay. So actually, you know, that's one of the things that IEF. Uh, likes to do is have actionable insights. Ideas that are generated at our forums, uh, we would be very happy if those ideas are amplified so that people can pick up on that and act on that. Uh, so I'm glad to be having this discussion because I think there are several people in the room here who would have some ideas of what do you think should be done because we should address that elephant in the room with ideas and proposals which might then get into the right hands or ears and uh, allow uh, shaping that direction in the, right, uh, in the right way. And hearing your ideas, Ilham, is a starting point. But I'd like to, at this point, bring in the uh, forum that we have here. Uh, if anybody has any question that you'd like to pose to Ilham or a solution or an idea of how do you think we should be uh, bringing the ICT conversation into the bigger picture because ICT seems to be uh, running on its own track uh, yeah. successfully. I, I wouldn't say that's a bad thing. Because uh, there's a lot of public opinion that if uh, you want the IC sector to really be yeah. involved, you would ask the government not to be involved. Can I add something? So there are various kind of views on that. Would yeah. you like to comment on that no, first? No, I'd I like to add something. Because yeah. the topic is, uh, if I see the screen, it says from G20 to ASEAN. Yeah. Yeah. So what do we do in ASEAN, Mr. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, how, and how is that useful to understand in context with the ICT? Uh, well, Indonesia happens to be the chair of ASEAN in the coming year. So there's a chance for us Indonesians to bring something meaningful for ASEAN. Yeah. At the same time, we, have, we do have the so-called ASEAN Free Trade Agreement. So a flow of data and services should be uh, enabled in a, can I say, in an easy way. Yeah. There are restrictions, but the, the collaboration between nations within the ASEAN context is something uh, that people work towards, right? Because we believe that if ASEAN with 660 million people or seven, going to 700 soon uh, is going, getting stronger and stronger, then uh, it will benefit all of ASEAN nations. Yeah? So ICT will be uh, something... Uh, Which I you think, can take up for the ASEAN region to start yeah, with. Okay. Yeah, that is important. How to understand the lessons learned, so maybe the, the data sphere, how to basically make sure that at least within ASEAN we, 
we know how to handle that with, with all the other nations. Yeah. So actually, you know, I would like to ask a couple of pointed questions into the audience. So we have Rob here from Microsoft. Rob, uh, you have had a lot of uh, global perspective, or I would say regional perspective, on how data centers uh, or the other businesses that you have is concentrated around the ASEAN region. And how is it connected to the big picture globally? Would you like to just add some of your thoughts there, Rob? Yeah, thanks, Sachin, and, and thanks, um, Dr. Ilham. I think it's a very... Could you very, keep the microphone a little closer? Yeah. I think it's a very appropriate conversation, and one that we absolutely grapple with as well. Uh, and you just mentioned the concept of unified governance and approaches to, to data or data across ASEAN as a, as a possibility. I know I look at the list of standards that we, we try and meet in order to provide security and clarity of uh, data protection and privacy as well. And, and the example of GDPR in Europe was a standard for data privacy that we were were able to build into from a technical perspective, but then ultimately allow businesses looking to drive transformation to take advantage of tools and technologies to meet those regulations. And, and for me, I think it's a very interesting one. How do we, and potentially a view here from Indonesia, in leapfrogging without having legacy policies in place necessarily around a data sovereignty and the like. I think that brings huge opportunity and an opportunity to lead as well. But how do we balance that nation state or the, the national protectionism that is often spoken about to then enable that collaboration as well? Uh, and it's something I don't have an answer for, but I'd love your thoughts and potentially how we can collaborate on progressing those agendas as well, because I think it's a hindrance potentially for genuine transformation, uh, for real collaboration across nations. And uh, we touched on data sharing initiatives in healthcare yesterday as an example. Uh, how do we help accelerate those? And we have a vested interest into trying to accelerate those as well. Likewise, how do we ensure the technology keeps up with the policies in country as well? And I liken it, New Zealand is a cloud-first policy. Uh, Australia is mostly. Uh, Singapore has a multi-stage policy for data and the likes. Philippines is open. How do we, how do we bring something, some consensus together? And is it even possible? Or is it something that is potentially out of the reach of, of collaboration. So I appreciate there's a couple of parts to that question, uh, but we'd love to understand where you're thinking and, and how we could potentially help in that context of Indonesia and ASEAN. So Ilham, uh, I think what Rob um, uh, says is uh, the opportunity to engage, especially during ASEAN, uh, yeah. as thought leadership from companies like Microsoft, uh, some of the large uh, AWS, etc. Are these are the organisations that should probably yeah. engage more with Vantiknas, maybe for the ASEAN oh, we have already uh, discussions. Think, yeah. Met a few times, I think, regarding Vantiknas. Um, well, uh, I believe that Microsoft is uh, uh, present in all ten ASEAN nations. Yeah? So uh, perhaps there could be some showcase yeah? how data and the like is handled within the system of Microsoft itself and to, in order to create confidence in countries and the people that use, the, 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 the citizens that use data uh, and have a interest, have an interest to um, be getting data from other parts of ASEAN or, uh, or conveying data they only to other parts of ASEAN. Yeah. So I don't know, um, is, is it required from by, uh, by, 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 by most countries to have a data, data center in, in their own country for, 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 for Microsoft? No. So when, we're not having that requirement in, in every country. In it's some, just, yes, right? Some, yes. Absolutely some, yes. I think Indonesia is one. Yeah. The, and Philippines is not, I think. Right? Philippines is not, no. no. And it's mm. the uniqueness Indonesia's view is at least a copy of data. Yeah, to be here to your, the, your the point mirroring, here. right? Yeah, and that's yeah. the... And in my mind, it's how do we make better technology and investment decisions to support the transformation agenda? And if I link it back to, to maybe yesterday's talent pipeline conversation mm. and the concept of autonomy and portability of students across ASEAN as a possibility, mm. that's going to require records and student data, which is something that's often highly private, to potentially cross borders. And how do we meet everybody's regulation at the same time? So it's, that's the 
the, those outcomes that we could possibly achieve yeah. if we could unlock this uh, is where I'm thinking. Uh, but again, more than happy, I think it's a great question. Can we showcase where it's being done in maybe other yeah. geopolitical regions? Uh, no, or also maybe countries? within ASEAN itself. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's cases in ASEAN like Philippines, they don't require it. Indonesia does require it. There's actually another aspect that needs to be talked about is the digital tax, right? Mm. There's, it's, it's up and coming and people are not sure how to do this. How to tax actually digital matters. Yeah? And uh, it's something... Uh, not it's it's in the making yeah yeah okay so uh, uh, dr mai bayu would you like to jump into this conversation because you know you, you are involved quite a lot in the banking sector thank you uh, yeah uh, thank you sachin thank you habibi and the uh, uh, audience so i would like to raise three issues regarding these uh, digital transformations especially for asean and those maybe countries related to asean if we see the members of G20s, if we list them down, I think um, many of them, most of them are advanced countries, developed countries, and some of them are developing countries. Uh, there, are, there are three issues that uh, I think uh, we need to connect with this uh, digital transformation, especially with ASEAN and those countries uh, who are still developing. Number one is the uh, economic impact of the uh, digital transformation. As we know that uh, digital transformation bring us products, translate them physical into virtual that can uh, be affordable for many of people, like uh, what we're having now here, high, high level conversations that uh, could be uh, attended uh, by invitations only, you know, if we don't have this digital transformations, only we can enjoy these uh, conversations. But with uh, uh, YouTube, with the Zoom, then uh, any of the students of uh, any universities in Indonesia and all over the world can follow these discussions for free, right? Previously, if you, they, they want to come, if, if even the free, they sh still have to pay the transportations and everything. So, uh, yeah, I, I wrote a book, this uh, actually, uh, I wrote the book, The Digital Transformation for Banks in Indonesia, 260 pages. Uh, I would like to share with uh, as many people as possible, but if I have to give every copy of this book to every Indonesian, 270 million people, I can imagine how many would go into trash bins and it create another problem again, right, for, for that. But if I distribute this as e-books for free, then those who like it can open it up. Who doesn't like it, then just leave it up. Then uh, there will be no potential problems for, for the next, right? So it solves a lot of problems for economic, for especially for countries that has uh, uh, less fortunate people that they can afford uh, products that previously can be enjoyed only for those who can pay. So this is a very potential that I think uh, could be pushed by the, uh, those countries who has this necessity to, to make this to be the agenda, how to make this happen even better for the countries. Uh, I think uh, ASEAN consists uh, more of these uh, countries, uh, except Singapore, I think, right? Uh, for the others, I think this is very important. Number two is that, uh, how this digital transformation will affect the industry competitiveness. Because we know from uh, the history, being a less developed country, becoming developing country, and become developed country, history tells us it's going through industrializations. And where does the industri industrialization bring the country into the uh, better income? By labor by getting the labor work, employment, then the people can get employment, can get salary, and then uh, becoming um, better in economic uh, performance. But through these digital transformations, I believe uh, there are a lot of threat to the laborers, to the blue laborers who has no skills for this. And it, it is a time bomb, I think, for countries with the big populations uh, like India and like Indonesia and uh, those uh, with the big population. China is a, a little bit different because 
they have a lot of uh, people, but at the same time, they can uh, invite the, the world to have manufacturers there. Yeah, for those who are not yet, uh, uh, it's still human work. Yeah. But for the countries that, number one, the skill, uh, skills of people on, on the low level not catch up to the ICT, and uh, not to mention that by ICT you need less people. Yes, you, can, you say there are a lot of new various jobs available developing because of the uh, digital transformation, but what kind of jobs are they? Are they reachable by those, the blue collars that we, have, we are having right now? Uh, Upskillings and reskillings can help them to transform that fast. I don't think so, right? So it is a, a, a very big time bomb for those countries with uh, big populations on the employment once this ICT taken place everywhere in the industries, right? So that is a very uh, important issue, I think, to bring up uh, for the, you know, for, for developing countries, they're enjoying it. I mean, they, they're not now re relying on those developing countries for the cheap labors, the cheap land or whatever. They can do it uh, directly, even the customs manufacturing, right? And number three, uh, is that uh, the data, yeah, the data. I think uh, we have done a lot on the data protections. We have a GDPR, Indonesia just recently, last month, uh, already approved the law on the personal data protection law, yeah. Uh, but uh, more on the organizations, more on the commercials, more on the people organizations. What about that law applies also for governments? Right. So if you collect data, any government collect data, you should tell, at least to the other countries who, whose, uh, whose uh, 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 residents have the data on them, that what data you have collected from the persons, yeah, what, is, what the purpose is, and what are you going to do with that. Right. So uh, you see all, the, all those regulations apply only for commercials or organizations but they don't touch on the government's uh, obligations to, to, you know, to also uh, yeah, being enforced to do the same thing, right? If it is used for uh, governments as well, and governments agree for that, I think it's a, a big help for us how to govern the data because it's very scary that uh, we, uh, we didn't know what data they have and even their data that we don't even realize that they have about us you know, uh, uh, that uh, somebody holds our data that, is, uh, that we don't know. And even if the data is wrong, then we cannot do anything about that, right? So I think that, uh, that, is, that are the three uh, things that I yeah. like to light up here. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bayou. Ilham, would you like to respond uh, to some of the issues that Dr. Bayou brought up? Yeah, well... Uh, The fear that um, there will be a problem with uh, uh, labor or with uh, workplaces because of the ICT revolution is, I think, you can find it everywhere. It's automation and the, uh, I mean, exaggeratedly, some, some people will think that artificial intelligence can take over so many jobs. Uh, so some of the jobs we know right now uh, will be superfluous right? because it's taken over a machine. Uh, I think uh, if you look down, go back to history, all the, digit, all the revolutions before, the mechanical, the electrical, the computer revolution, were having a similar effect. There were people losing jobs. At the same time, there were always new jobs created. Yeah? So I think uh, the, the reality of uh, our world is that um, nothing is static. Everything changes all the time. Uh, uh, it is absolutely necessary for governments and for people to realize that, that much of it lies in education. Um, by you, you mentioned upskilling, etc. It's, it's really necessary, right? Uh, increased digital literacy is, is not an easy thing, but it's a necessary thing. And um, some of the jobs that will be there in the future, we don't even know yet. Yeah? There's a lot of things, but one thing it requires is um, we need to adapt. 
I mean, humans need to adapt to that. Uh, there are some who cannot adapt or don't want to adapt, and that is causing some of the tension that we see in some countries, like in the U.S., for instance. Yeah. There's a lot of people that feel left out you know, by, by what's, what's been happening in the U.S., and, and the jobs are under, under, under threat, or they're not, avail not there anymore. Uh, I think it's understandable. However, this is, yeah, I think this is something we cannot force the world to stop developing. Well, it just continues. Yeah. And, and, and we have to um, be ready for changes. Right? And we ourselves have to change all the time. So uh, I, I think this is something we, we need to tell the story to, to lots of people. People sometimes they don't realize that or they don't know or they don't want to change. They want it just as they are used to. But, well, uh, if you look, tell you a story, yeah? I mean, um, in the old days, uh, when we're, you, you talk about books, yeah? uh, Mr. Gutenberg, many hundred years ago, invented the printing machine. Uh, and by doing that, there were lots and lots of people out of a job. Because the way they did books before that, they were doing by hand. <laughs> there were lots of writers. Right? They, they were basically uh, suddenly out of a job. Yeah? But what it did, I mean, what, what does it do, the, the book being printed? Well, if, you can imagine, right, if you buy a book from somebody who does it by hand, how much does it cost? And how much can it do? And now, books are printed it's much cheaper and uh, much, uh, much bigger quantities of books are available. And so people are getting smarter by that. Yeah? So the, 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 and now you, you mentioned e-books. Yeah? I mean, if people are serious about wanting to change, they can get a lot of e-books easily. Uh, and, and, and basically use that to educate themselves. Yeah. So I think there's, there's always a side effect of those revolutions uh, which actually increases the quality of the human resources. Right? Uh, and, and, and those people will be more capable of doing jobs that we're not even dreaming about, I think. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, th I think that's the only thing I'd like to comment on. Yeah. Yeah. You make a very good point that actually, you know, skilling up requirements have never changed. No. It's been there from years and years, uh, thousands of years, and uh, we're just facing our problem of today. And yeah. we're trying to solve today's problem. Yeah, well, well, I mean, from, in, yeah. in the old days, they were, we were doing horse carriages, and there were drivers using horses, etc. Where are those people? They, 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 they lost the their job. They yeah. lost their job, right? Yeah. So, is it good for them? Maybe yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you're right. In yeah. fact, that's the only way there can be transformation change if people adopt yeah. to the changes that are taking place around to create a better quality of life. Uh, Rajiv from Spendflow, would you like to add something here? Because, you know, Rajiv, you've operated businesses across so many different countries. Do you have a view on what's happening here versus some parallels around the other parts of the world? Sure. Uh, thanks, Sachin, and uh, thanks, Dr. Ilham, for your great insights. Um, very, very interesting to understand your perspectives on this. So, my thoughts on this, Sachin, is, uh, so I, get, I come from the SaaS world, so software as a service world, where we are able to uh, build software and deploy software very quickly to people around the world and people are able to adopt technology to build efficiencies across countries and in, in fact governments through the world, right? So when it comes to SaaS, uh, one of the things that I see that uh, uh, is exciting about Indonesia is there are some phenomenal products and companies that are coming up from here, but a lot of them are catering to the local markets as of today. So there are few companies that you can talk about where it has been built from Indonesia to the world. And one of the main reasons for that I see is, again, there's a huge market here for local solutions, but also from a knowledge perspective and the ability for people to build businesses on top of existing new technologies is something that uh, is yet, to, as an infra, is yet to be built out here. So, uh, Elam, uh, Dr. Elam, it will be uh, uh, ideal to understand your thoughts on how you are uh, building an ecosystem where people are going to be building from Indonesia to the world, and what is the roadmap that you have for that? That's a good one, Elam. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you're talking about uh, digital products from Indonesia to the world, yeah. Okay, I think uh, if you look at what's available in Indonesia, all these startups on the companies that are dealing with ICT. Uh, right now, my impression is they are by and large focused on Indonesia. <laughs> Perhaps because the market is so big. Yeah? 
However, um, they're starting now to go cross-border. Yeah? Some of them have looking at Malaysia uh, and other countries in the region. So I think uh, uh, rather than to go global, they will probably go regional. Yeah? Uh, at the same time, um, global companies have, some of them have actually in the end shied away from ASEAN, like uh, Uber, right? Uber, at some point in time, they struck a deal with, I forgot, was it Grab or Grab, right? Grab. That Grab would basically do the business here and there, there was some sort of deal because in the end to really do global everywhere in this world in every country is very, very hard. Yeah? Uh, so country, companies will pick and choose. Yeah? Uh, Indonesia is a very large country and um, there are um, experiences that we can get from other large countries, how, like India. Right? Uh, let's say e-commerce. Uh, the the assumption is that in the end, after a lot of uh, concentration of the market, there will be maybe only two dominant players, one local and one global. Okay. And in Indonesia, we're not there yet, but uh, the thought is we are now in the startup winter and, and some, some of uh, startups are you know, thinking uh, ahead whether they can really survive the game. Uh, and uh, what I see that there will be concentration. Well, it's just maybe not enough room for so many players. Similar thing will be in the fintech world. Similar thing will be in the media, like OTT. So it really depends on the sector, uh, but the concentration will, is happening already. At the same time, what I see for many Indonesian companies is what they probably do. If you talk, it depends really on what, uh, let's talk about, say, OTT, media, right? Then, of course, a language comes into play, right? I mean, uh, Indonesian OTTs, uh, they are focused on Indonesian content, Indonesian language. Uh, in today's world, of course, we can watch any content in any language, and then we have these subtitles, and it's actually quite enjoyable. Right? We, can, uh, we don't have to translate everything into English. The original content is, I think, uh, the original language is sometimes quite, uh, quite useful because you can uh, feel the emotions, and, and it's so, sort of like more authentic. Yeah? Uh, so Bollywood movies are, but if, if I watch them in Netflix, they're many times not translated, right? Uh, but they are just with subtitles, and that's fine. Uh, but I think the, the, the relevance of the, of the, of the, the content uh, is um, maybe more regional. Yeah, something which is liked in Asia or East Asia, Southeast Asia, I don't think it's going to fly in Europe, for instance, yeah? and the other way around. <laughs> it's, uh, there's only a few global players. Yeah? Uh, so what you said, basically, Raj, I think uh, we have to look at every sector by sector. Yeah? Uh, yeah. E-commerce uh, is uh, uh, a concentration process happening, I think. Um, from other countries, we'll see that there's one local, one global. Uh, in the OTT, is a global, regional, and local. Uh, it, it gets complicated, yeah? but there is always a room for a strongly local player because they specialize on something local, they would actually, I think, uh, be withering in their, uh, in their competitiveness if they would attempt to be global. They have to focus on the local in order to survive because there's room in the market for that. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it really uh, depends on the sector. So the, we, we talked about the media, the OTTs, the FinTech is a similar story, I think, because uh, FinTech in the end is very local because of the rules of the Financial Service Authority, right? There's different rules in different countries. Yes, we have Basel, which is global, but at the same time, there's some, for a country like Indonesia, having learned from the uh, financial crisis 98, 99, there are some rules which are very uh, Indonesian, yeah? and, and, and that comes from the experience. In other countries, it's different. So, uh, um, yeah, I, I think... Uh, no, it really depends on, 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 on the sector. <laughs> no, the, the point, uh, one point I would love to add to it is some, some technologies here are really amazing, right? So, for example, uh, Gojek, etc. Are, yeah. are, are applications that are transcending different, the, every touch point of a consumer's life. And a lot of countries outside of ASEAN today or even in ASEAN today do not have those. So, the ability for, for con companies that are born in Indonesia cater to this market really well and solve for these problems and these problems are pretty global in nature as well. Yeah. So, if they can look at expanding 
borders and going and exporting that tech and and growing i think indonesia has a great place around the world to do this that that's yeah, my yeah. honest opinion. i think the unique is if we talk about gojek uniqueness of gojek is because they have this very large portion of motorcycle taxis so in order to flourish in any given country you have to have that large yeah. amount of motorcycle taxis first that's not a given in many countries even in asean if you look say malaysia malaysia doesn't have that many motorcycles there's way less than indonesia indonesia is like 10 times uh, we have more than 100 million motorcycles. Yeah? In, in other countries, it's not the case. So the economics don't work then. The, the model is different, right? I mean, we can do all these, these mini deliveries. You, you order one burger from McDonald's <laughs> or from anywhere, and somebody picks it up and brings it to one burger or one milkshake. Or oh, they don't sell milkshake here, I know. So basically, uh, one burger. You can do it here because there are so many people around. Right? It doesn't work in every country. So you have to have the uh, economic conditions first in order to to be able to uh, uh, execute that business model. I think. And uh, I could imagine, I don't know every uh, ASEAN country so well, but uh, I, I can imagine there's, not every country has so, that many motorcycles in Indonesia. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I'd like to ask uh, Ambassador yeah. Bharti. Uh, Ambassador Bharti here uh, is very knowledgeable about uh, digital India and uh, some of the issues happening there. So would you like to comment, please? Thanks, Sachin. Uh, I will be taking a different angle. Before that, I must uh, thank Dr. Ilham for your talks and views. And good morning, everyone. There are too many people in the business sector here, so I pay my apologies to them when I say this. Uh, in all our discussions, we have on ICT or, or digital transformation and everything, we have seen that it is the corporate interest that we are trying to uh, find a solution and things like that. When will it be the right time to bring in environment and society, effect on society, of all transformation that we are talking about? Is it the right time before it becomes too late? That is the point I will leave as a thought. And the other thing that was mentioned as on India's model of digital transformation, I'm coming from that and I'm asking this question, should ICT be left as a corporate money spinner or should it be for public benefit? And the last comment that I like to make, I read a few months ago in Jakarta Post itself about something called splinternet versus internet. Each country trying to develop its own internet, which is the concept of splinternet. How, what is your views on this, Dr. Uh, Elham? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, uh, for your very good comments. Um, if I may start with the splinter net first, uh, if I, uh, just to clarify, that means that the internet is basically confined to the borders of one country. Right? And so if you go abroad, abroad meaning outside that country, you would have to enter the internet rather than the splinter net. Is that what you, what you mean? Well, I think that uh, the very essence of the internet is actually that it is borderless. Yeah. Uh, so, which is uh, something, I think, it's sort of like a uh, extreme version of globalization because you have the globe basically in your computer, right? It's, it's right there with all the benefits and all the disadvantages. Uh, but but it, thinking about the internet, what it did to the world and the globalization, it, it, it brought it forward another step, right? So because you can connect between uh, people, co companies, countries, uh, in a way that uh, you don't feel the distance, yeah? Yet, I mean, if you talk about physical realization of a trade, of course, you need to have the logistics, et cetera, et cetera. So the internet came also with lots of uh, challenging logistical questions, yeah? You, if it's transmitting or conveying data and money, that is maybe, easier than you order something like a, a, piece, a piece of cloth in a, in a country through the internet and it needs to be brought over to the uh, 
to, 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 to us, to me as a buyer in, 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 in another country, maybe even in another continent. I remember I asked my secretary to buy me something. It was something very trivial, a, a deodorant. Yeah? Because there's a certain German brand that I like, and I, I said, buy it in Tokopedia. Uh, and you know where she got it? From uh, Paraguay. Because it was sold out in anywhere, but she could find it from a shop in Paraguay. So it was shipped somehow from that shop in Paraguay to Indonesia, to arrive here in Indonesia. Okay, this sounds very wonderful, I think, because um, there's a lot of uh, uh, globalization is meant to be uh, reducing poverty, which it really did, I think, in many cases. At the same time, uh, uh, this form of globalization is actually making our world also uh, more critical when it comes to climate change. Yeah? Because if you imagine, if everything goes to and fro, there's so much logistic happening, so much energy, sometimes wasted for a small thing, you don't really need to do that. And I think the second version of the internet, it, it, uh, not a second wave, yeah, will actually empower people to produce uh, their own things uh, uh, by themselves using digital machines. Uh, this is something that has been put forward by, um, well, I'm a little bit involved in this because we, we just did a major conference in, in Bali about this. And um, it is actually f founded on the ideas that were created by MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, by a group calling themselves the Fab Foundation or Fab Labs around the world, meaning the, the, the mojo of the Fab Lab is you want to produce as many things as you can yourself. So what does it mean? The bits travel globally, but the atoms stay at home, meaning you produce, you use your local raw material, you do everything here, but you can share ideas and designs, data with other people all around the world. But by basically localizing uh, production, the idea is that um, uh, you will actually empower more people to be uh, being manufacturer, right? They will be producing things, not just consuming things. So I think the, the, the first wave of internet uh, has produced a lot of global, pro global uh, consumers. You can consume and you can buy from anywhere. But uh, what it did is that there were countries who were benefiting enormously from that because they were producing like for the world. But I think in, in retrospect, um, that cannot continue like this. Yeah, we, have, we need to make sure that the manufacturing part, the production was more evenly distributed and it's also not good for the climate and for the energy if everything is just shipped around globally. <laughs> uh, uh, and so um, that is maybe the second phase or the third phase, I don't know whether there's another phase, but the, the forthcoming phase is basically to do that. And so uh, the internet itself, if you talk about the splinter net, yeah, just isolating that, uh, an internet, of, people call it sometimes also intranet, yeah, that's more for companies I think. But I, I think the, this effect of uh, getting the best ideas globally would be much, much diminished. And I, I'm afraid that the, uh, the benefit will be also much less for, for the users of the split net vis-a-vis -vis the users of the internet. Yeah? Uh, because you would be confined to the ideas to be found in your country. Yeah? And, and sometimes you want, not sometimes, you want to have other ideas out of the box other, from other people. Uh, and you can source that much better if you are from the beginning using the internet, not the split internet. The other, so, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, Complete. Go ahead. Nothing in this. No. Uh, I, I think the, the other thing you, you raised, uh, Your Excellency, the, uh, the notion of whether ICT should be public or should be privately used. Public means it's uh, something made available to all citizens at very low cost, if, if, if at any cost at all. Uh, that is, I think, more really um, how the country, the government or the citizens of a country see government, right? I mean, some expect it, that it is provided by government. I think India is very similar to Indonesia, uh, but others don't, right? Uh, U.S. would be like on the totally different, right? They, they, they don't want any government, yeah? So uh, they are much more okay if it's done by private companies because they don't trust the government and they, 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 and, and, and they, they, they trust more big companies yeah. uh, uh, because they think they are more efficient, uh, they are, uh, they're, they're, there's no politics involved because it's business only, etc. But this is really more a philosophical question. How can we basically uh, see, how, see how do countries see themselves? Uh, how does the state 
position itself vis-à-vis the citizens and what is the role of government and what do the citizens actually want from the government. Yeah? That's, uh, I think, in, again, India and Indonesia have much more things in common than, for instance, in the United States. The United States is very different. And there might be other countries more like the United States. Maybe UK, I don't know. Uh, maybe UK is uh, also looking at small government. Yeah? I mean, it's, uh, I remember the, the previous uh, Prime Minister, Mrs. Truss, she was always uh, propagating the idea of a small government. Yeah? She wanted a small and, and lean, which is not wrong. Uh, I think itself, because if you're lean, you're, you're cost efficient and you're maybe also more uh, effective in what you do. Uh, b but again, I mean, the, in Indonesia, uh, the expectation of the people is that the government takes care of the citizens a lot. <laughs> it can be done by a small government, I think. Yeah? They want government to govern and basically pamper, maybe almost. <laughs> yeah. So so Ilham, I've been watching the time, and I know that you have to leave. It's yeah. uh, we're just over for a few minutes. So we will continue this conversation uh, after the coffee break because the digital transformation topic is very much there. I know there are a lot of other people who want to we'll take a little bit of a deep dive, but we have to uh, allow Ilham to leave. I think the um, summary of the conversation uh, that he had with some of you is absolutely on the right track of how can we look at some of the more difficult issues that are actually surrounding the whole idea of digital transformation. And I think, you know, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic put a brakes, put the brakes on digital transformation and globalization in a big way to reinvent itself, uh, which is, if you look at food supply, actually, the COVID pandemic did make sure people started growing food locally because you could not transport it in the early days of the pandemic. They had not figured out how exactly you're going to do logistics across countries. So a lot of producers did look at having local food products, etc. Food being a basic need. But if it's not on a basic need, then it, the concept still works in a different way. So I think we should continue this conversation another time, Ilham. We will be having more sessions with Ilham at the Indonesia Economic Forum. We're looking at once a month, some event or the other. And I know since Ilham has to leave, I would like to close this now so we can all go into a coffee break. Thank you very much. A warm round of applause for Ilham. Thank you. We look forward to more insights like this, Ilham, which we can amplify through the Economic Forum because we had some good ideas come out of you today. Thank you.